Good morning, everybody. My name is Connor Flanagan. I'm the Director of Education here at the Southampton History Museum. And this morning we are uh, joined by a couple of really great people. Uh, so first we have Brian, who was the director, editor, uh, one of the co-producers and the sort of principal filmmaker of the film Thousand Years of Witness. Um, we have uh, Ganu, one of the other co-producers and consultant on the film, worked on a bunch of the other everything else going on, uh, as well as Ali, who is one of the, uh, the other co-producer. Um, I think everybody here that worked on this film wore many different hats, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we go forward. Um, and I want to ask everybody that's watching right now, um, if you've already seen the film, uh, please submit any questions or comments you might have about this film, either in the Q&A function or the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar. Uh, I'll be monitoring those as we talk, and I will ask any questions you guys submit as you go forward. Um, but my first question is, or I guess before we get into questions, I'll just say, Brian, do you want to just talk about the film a little bit um, and just sort of give everybody a rundown? Yeah, I, I guess stone from the beginning about, uh, I'm a professional photographer and about six years ago, I started working with the Shinnecock and it kind of spread around the tribe that, you know, I was doing, I, I, I'm just going to assume work that they enjoyed and then um, I just carried on doing it. I was going family to family, kids, elders, uh, you know, even middle-aged people. And then about two years ago, I took a portrait of a gentleman whose name was Tree. And it was just a casual portrait at the powwow. And sadly, you know, two or three months later, he passed away. And it, it was very rapid. He, he went from, you know, healthy to uh, not being here and, and everyone was devastated. So I thought, well, if that's going to happen and it does happen, that's life. I, I just had the idea of possibly interviewing and documenting as many elders as we could, um, you know, to get a really nice side of the reservation to get their memories, their childhood memories, keeping politics out of it. So I had to ask all the families and all the people that I had photographed if they would be comfortable with me interviewing their grandparents, their mother, their father. And, uh, you know, Gnu jumped on board straight away because we've, we've actually, even before then, we made another movie together. Um, we'll talk about that soon. Um, and Ali Joseph being a Shinnecock, she wanted to definitely be involved in this. Well, we needed her because we couldn't, couldn't, couldn't really do this without any Shinnecock officials. So the, uh, the thing birthed right there and it took just a couple of months to get all the interviews. And as we accumulated like 820 years of uh, combined ages, we thought, hey, what wouldn't it be a good idea if we could reach 1000? So we did it, we got up to 1000 and we had to sneak in a six year old child to, mm -hmm. you know, cause we had 994 at the very end. Um, and, you know, for the people that have seen it, she is obviously the last one in it. Um, is that explanatory enough for you then? Yeah, it's pretty good. I, uh, so I had a question that I was gonna ask next, next if the uh, thousand years theme uh, was something you, you started with or saying that you happened upon as you were collecting these interviews. Yeah, yeah we just, uh, you know, when, when we started it, I kind of had an idea that it would be a number, but we just didn't know what the number was going to be. Cause you know, it took us a while to get 350 and then didn't know if we we're going to reach. So that was always the thought. And I think by the time we got just over three quarters the way, we realized that, you know, we need to come up with, is it a thousand years of witness? Is it a witness for a thousand years? So we were juggling around the possibility of the title combination. And I think we just all came across, you know, why not just a witness? 1,000 years, a witness. And then yeah, stuck with it. Yeah, it works out. It worked out really great. It's a nice, happy accident. Uh, but um, are you, do you have any plans to do like sort of a sequel to this or sort of a different anthology with this thousand years theme? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I've already been to Arizona. I worked with the uh, Navajo, whose real name is the Dina. Dine. 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 I guess depends on the accent. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I've started with them. I think I got, I was maybe one third through an episode with them. And then I had to come back because I was only there for a short weekend with a Navajo that lives on the Shinnecock. So she took me there, she introduced me, she escorted me because it's a very, very difficult reservation to get on. This was in February. 
Um, I've also worked with uh, the Cherokee of Oklahoma, already worked with them and they, when I presented the story to them, they jumped on board. They're very interested too. And, but because of COVID, obviously everything is kind of, the brakes have halted and I don't want to do anything online because I need to get the photographs, I need to get the interviews and also with the Lakota. So, but again, now we're in, you know, lockdown, we have to wait until it's safe to, to travel there. But there's a lot of other tribes also interested in this that have already been approached and, you know, it's all positive, but I think everyone's just focusing on the pandemic for now. Yeah. Um, Ali, so is there any, but any stories in particular that uh, meant anything to you personally that were told during the film or maybe one that didn't make the cut or something like that? Well, as a personal and family historian and producer, I had just come off um, about a year working on a PBS film, uh, also about Shinnecock that was very different, um, more about uh, land preservation rights, very political. And so this was sort of a breath of fresh air to uh, connect and reconnect with Brian, who I already knew, and, and Ganu, who's honorary family, of course. And, um, you know, continue the kind of work that I've been doing for about a decade, which is saving elder stories for families, um, not just native families, uh, for future generations. And so to hear a lot of the elders that I grew up with share some uh, moments from their childhoods on the reservation, there was a sort of fluidity and a, um, a through line um, that resonated with all of them, but I think what's important for, uh, you know, folks watching who are not Native is to be able to pull the cultural values that all Indigenous people share, no matter whether they're from Shinnecock or Ojibwe or uh, Diné or anything um, from this. And, and I was just actually talking with a, a group of uh, women in, in Alaska last night who are native um, and connected to me and we were talking about these values uh, for another project and it really is this idea that native people overcome all and Brian did a really great job um, and with Gnu as well as of, of I think conveying that no matter what native folks have been through we are still here and our core values remain the same which is embracing uh, the earth and preserving it in a way that we haven't seen done properly, uh, unfortunately, outside of Indian country and um, keeping each other close as communities, looking out for other people, even if they aren't of our ilk. Um, there's one poignant story that uh, Brian did a, a wonderful job of highlighting in this piece about how during um, a hurricane in the 30s, which was devastating on the east end of Long Island and elsewhere, the Shinnecock of their own volition helped Southampton folks get water at no cost. And you know, if the tables were turned, there probably would have been a different equation, right? So this idea that um, we live peacefully, we coexist, we still have our cultural values that are vital, and we don't, um, we won't change that no matter how many times we're beaten down. So, uh, you know, the story of, of, of sharing the water is one, the, the story of uh, several of the elders having to be sent to Indian schools um, is a, was a, um, a horrible injustice done to Native Americans in this country, which a lot of folks maybe don't know about, and children ripped from their families and forbidden to speak their own language. Um, and so these are touched upon in a really elegant way without feeling political, I think, and, and, and that was the goal. Yeah, I, uh, I watched the film first when Brian and I first talked about doing something like this, maybe almost a year ago or nine, nine ten months ago. Um, and then I just rewatched it again last night to, to refresh myself and prepare for this uh, talk today. And that was one of the things that really struck to me was um, it very much felt like a conversation, like I was just having with these people or just listening in on. And when they talked about these things that are, are quite serious and, uh, and really important, like the, the Indian schools, um, normally you would come across in a film very sort of politicized and, and things like that. But it almost comes across funny as they were talking about it, as like as somebody would talk about something like this, where this was really bad, but they're talking about it in sort of a more real way um, of like, 
presenting it where you're not really realizing what you're hearing until they finish when you're like, oh, um, which I do remember from school, not always learning these things. And as time goes on, uh, later on getting to high school and college, where you really sort of learn the real history of things that went on. Well, for anybody who is in that position currently, if there are any young people watching, I would recommend that uh, if, if, if you're still not getting that education, even at the high school and collegiate level, that you rush out and buy Howard Sins of People's History of the United States. And that um, gives, in my opinion, uh, a much truer portrait of uh, what has is, what is, um, happened to Native, Native folks, um, Indigenous people here, um, that you will not read even now in the prescribed history books. Very true. Uh, Ginu, do you have any stories in particular from the film or the filmmaking process that really struck out to you? Um, I'm, a, I'm always a very big fan um, of Uncle... Um, Ruben Hunter? Yeah. And um, being the eldest elder on the reservation, um, you know, I mean, just being there as part of the camera crew, it's one of those things where, um, as you were saying, um, the, the feeling that Indian humor, feeling like um, getting that native feel of being in front of an elder and listening. I mean, we were going for a long time and we didn't, we didn't even realize it. And um, I really loved his stories especially um, the way his memory is being able to recall things and to be able to share those things with us. That was probably one of my highlights of, of myself personally. And then, um, you know, even um, as Ali was saying, and I was saying um, to you before we started the actual meeting, um, I'm married into the tribe. Um, my mother married former tribal chairman, Charles Smith II. Um, so I am Allie's cousin, but through marriage, but growing up, um, everybody embraced me and, you know, considers me part of the tribe. And I think um, friends and family of the tribe is kind of like the, the term that we use. Um, so personally, also um, hearing stories that I haven't heard um, growing up, even knowing these elders personally, um, things I haven't known about, known about them because as you're growing up on the reservation, you know, there, there is secretiveness. There is um, that, not secret in a bad way, but like secretive in like, um, you know, keeping that purity of our, our existence um, out of the public ear, privacy, I should say. Um, so when you grow up and then you actually get to know these elders on a personal level is something that really impacted me. Things I haven't heard growing up and you know, all the years that I've been there, I think it's what, 35-ish years now, um, 33 years. So, I mean, um, that was probably the best being able to be a part of that. Um, there's no real stories that stuck out because they all stuck out to me because it's, it, it was fresh to my ears too. Yeah. Um, so we had we have a few questions that got submitted while we were talking. Um, first one, somebody was asking, um, how long is the film up as it is now for for uh, people to watch? And is there any plans to release it any further? It's thirty minutes exactly. Uh, the Shinnecock version is the the Shinnecock episode is the first episode, and then the second will be the Navajo. The third will be Lakota. But we may end up compiling them all together and do it as a you know, a U.S. national Native American thing, but that obviously the pandemic is yeah. the kibosh on that. But it's 30 minutes, give or take a few seconds. And, and the plan is to put that um, online for easy watchability for other people elsewhere or on a TV yeah. channel or? Yeah, it's, you know, well, I haven't, you know, I'm trying not to uh, monopolize on this. It, it was literally a practice to see if mm -hmm. we could do it. Um, I'm not thinking of, you know, Amazon. I'm not thinking of anything like that yet. It, it's, um, first of all, I would like to get all the tribes permission to do that. Just because I have it doesn't mean I can go ahead and put them publicly. Um, if they want to, and if they're all for it, then yeah, we can definitely push it. 
But uh, okay. as of now, there's no particular plan to do that. So, but but anybody now who has the link that they got from RC Pink for this, they Correct. can watch it there. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So and they can share it, you know, they can share it to their friends because, you know, they have the password and so they can share it for sure. Gotcha. If the numbers right. are going crazy. I may put a, <laughs> yeah. I may put a break on the share, but uh, until we make a plan with the Shinna card, because, you know, uh, without them, mm -hmm. there is no documentary, so. You know. Exactly. Um, so we have somebody else. Um, they're saying that they grew up hearing stories about how their grandmother was the child of a white person and a member of the Shinnecock tribe um, and was given up for adoption. I know her maiden name and her birth year, and she wants to know if there's any way that they can verify that she was actually Shinnecock. Uh, they did a little bit of research, though, a couple of websites, but didn't really get anywhere. Uh, we'll let Ali take that one. So, uh, you know, the tribe is not in the business of doing genealogy for others, but certainly what I could, and they won't go through the tribal role for an outsider, understandably. Um, but what I would suggest is, if, if it's really vital to you to know, um, going back through any family history that you have and really um, going through whatever elders you may have alive and looking through town and local records um, to try to identify names. If you had a, you know, say a last name, like in many small communities, there are original names that are unique to Shinnecock families, for example, as a finite number of those. And so if you came up and said, well, my, you know, this person was X, then, um, you know, one of us, certainly somebody local could tell you if, if, if that's a descended name, but, um, Generally, you have to do your own records uh, research through local records, um, um, shipping records. I don't know if there's immigration issues, stuff like that. Yeah, I would suggest also, um, I know at the Rogers Memorial Library, they have somebody that works there that does a lot of good genealogical work. Um, and they can help you looking through a lot of records that they have access to. Um, and then also here at the museum and our library, I mean, I would say 75% of the people that come and do research are just doing personal family genealogy. And so if you're local to Southampton, your family's been local, there's a pretty good chance we have something here that mentions something about them as well as the library. So um, I would echo what Ali just said of, of trying to buckle down and, and ask for some resources. Um, let's see. So this person's asking, uh, please tell us more about adoption of freed African-American slaves by the Shinnecock. Barry, so, again, if you should let Ali take that one. She knows more about the history of Shinnecock than myself. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's often in, in popular um, description, people wonder why um, Shinnecock people are often more uh, darker skinned appearing than quote Indians you'd see in a textbook. And um, certainly there were um, intermixing of Shinnecock and um, folks who were slaves um, on Long Island. There were slave owners in the North, in fact. And um, as far as adoption, I can't comment on, on that, but the relationships did develop and uh, lead to the intermixing and the beautiful, um, uh, I should say, the, the beautiful tapestry that we see today in our Shinnecock children, which, um, you know, goes from the lightest to the darkest. And so, and the, and the unique thing I think about Native folks is, um, you know, people ask, what is an Indian? And, and, you know, an Indigenous person could look anyway. So you you never really know who you're talking to. You know, you don't just look like somebody in an encyclopedia. And so, you know, I, I am not aware of a formal adoption process. I believe that from my understanding and research that there was, um, th there were relationships developed. Oh yes, that's my son. He's bored and needs help with online school. And I, I can't, you know, we can't do everything. What are you gonna do? Um, he's in his pajamas still too, uh, cause why not? So, so yeah, so I'm, I'm not the authority on that, but I will say that, that there was not a formalized adoption. And so the use of that particular word is, is surprising to me. 
Yeah, I think maybe they were, uh, in, I'm slightly interpreting it as uh, adopting free African-American slaves as um, just African-American people in general, not so much children, almost like culturally adopting them as well. Not that I'm aware of, no. The Shinnecock have always been inclusive to other, uh, and just for, when I say Indians, like only Native Americans can, can say that. You're not supposed to call us Indians. It's sort of, yeah. <laughs> you know? um, but typically Native folks are very inclusive, as Gadu said, to other Native people from other other tribes. We don't see it as any difference. In fact, in in uh, Native culture across all tribes, you call any elder an auntie, even if they're not related to you, uh, or an uncle, for example. Or grandma or an grandpa, elder. Even, you know, What's that? Or grandma or grandpa, even. Yep. So there's always a, a respect for elders and an adoption of those terms of respect and, and affection, no matter whether you're related. But no, they don't habitually, um, you know, take in or, or, you know, adopt or share culture with, with other folks. Now, if you develop a relationship organically, like that's, everybody does that, right? Yeah. So Ali, if I can, um, if you can correct me if I'm wrong on anything. Um, the way I've always, um, the way I've always heard it in explaining these certain things is that also the Shinnecock are, a first contact tribe. And in the history, um, intermixing was one of those things that would, um, that was implemented by the US government to eradicate the Indian as we, um, as we know it stereotypically, you know? So, I mean, so if you, I'm Ojibwe and give an example, um, Originally, we came from here on the East Coast, but at the time of contact of European settlers, we lived on the Great Lakes. So we've had um, two to 300 years less contact than our brothers and sisters, the Shinnecock people. So the, the things such as intermixing and um, um, decimating our, our tribes and taking away our youth, all of those things have happened two to 300 years before we encountered um, European people. So when people come across, um, and especially, um, it's one of those things that peeves me growing up here because it's, it's um, I get stopped on the road sometimes and people look at me and some people say that I have the stereotypical Hollywood look of what an Indian is supposed to look like. And they stop me on the road and say, why do you look like a real Indian? It's because my people haven't met your people. You know, it, it took them about 300 years to get to me. <laughs> but now my people are going through the same thing where um, we have a lot of French influence. So just the opposite here was a lot of African-American influence as well. So a lot, of, a lot of what Indians look like is from the actual um, European advancement onto the tribe. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if a lot of that is correct, Ali, but I don't know if you- And there's any. always, and you know, oh, man, I needed to know. And there, I mean, there's always, uh, there were, were, were long efforts by the US government as has long been established to eradicate, you know, the, the indigenous people here by any way possible. And um, at a certain point, the slave trade from the American South did migrate uh, north for, for uh, freedom and the Underground Railroad. And so as, as uh, uh, escaped slaves and you know, then later freed slaves made their way north, there, there was that um, intermixing um, that I described, but my understanding you know, historically is primarily that there were slaves on Long Island and, co and, and colonists and, um, you know, and so uh, African slaves um, worked um, on the North and South Fork and over on Shelter Island. And, um, and here now our people have been one of the only tribes that I know of, um, not the only, but one of fewer who were never removed from our original land. So the Shinnecock have been um, in in the area in which we now um, are relegated to, which is the reservation, which is a far smaller parcel than 
obviously uh, we originally had, which was all over um, this part of Long Island. And, um, and uh, you know, we've been here over 10,000 years. So yeah, so I think, you know, there's, there's, um, there was an effort to do anything to dilute the Native American culture from, from the people um, through assimilation. And uh, also, I think one of the other tactics was actually racial reclassification, um, where a lot of natives were put into African American communities because um, we were dark skinned as well, you know. Um, so, and of course, on top of that, you, you know, love is love, and when people meet, you know, so we can't stop that, of course. Um, yeah. Well, well, speaking on that a little bit, um, somebody said, uh, submitted a question where they're asking if uh, you have any plans to document the stories of the Montauki people um, and any of their descendants who are living in Eastville and elsewhere on Long Island, as well as a majority of them are actually now living in Wisconsin. So they're a good example <laughs> of one of the tribes that are local here that got moved around the United States a little bit more. Yeah, I actually have already started photographing uh, Montauki. Um, a few weeks ago, we had a uh, family on the Shinnecock and I was blessed to be asked to take some photos and we got really creative. So I do have the photos, but we didn't hold interviews yet. We had plenty of time. Again, we're trying to do everything within the pandemic and not be in each other's, um, you know, but distant out of photograph is a different story. So we will, I don't know how many Montauket there are because they are very spread out. Um, I know there are a few in Montauk and I have for a year and I've been trying to reach out, but you know, I can't push that issue. If people are interested, they'll reach out. So it, it's any tribe really that would like to, you know, consider being a part of documenting this way, or even if we just consult if they want to do it themselves. You know, we're more than happy to just kind of, you know, help them, you know, do what the equipment they need. And, uh, you know, it's not like we're trying to get the monopoly on this. Um, we just enjoy doing it and think it's a very important thing, you know. Yeah, I would say one quote from the film that I made sure to write down that I thought was really important. Uh, I believe it was said by Shane Weeks, who I've met a bunch of times here at the museum and worked with loosely on a few things. Uh, he says very early that uh, when an elder dies, a library burns with them. Yes. Um, and that, I think it was probably one of the first things said in the film and it just sets up a great thesis point, I think for everything we're saying now, everything that you said uh, with the film itself, yeah. that just doing this documentation process is, is really important for uh, preserving the actual stories uh, and the perspectives of these people that live through the history that we're all trying to research and, and know about. Well, well that, that particular line though, you know, to give credit, it was actually a, a African uh, lady documentary maker that was doing the same as what we were doing way before we were doing it. And that is actually her quote that we took and we used it. She gotcha. did it in the tongue of the people that she was interviewing, but translated basically, that's how it came out. I wish I had a name for you because she's very deserving of it. Maybe it was one of the elders that gave it to her. I don't know, um, you know, because there wasn't that much information on it. But it just resonated with what we're doing. And, and you know, and that's what really got this going full force, get it as quick as we could. Because when they do die, a library does burn with them, literally, you know. So it's, it's very uh, prolific, but it's true. Yeah, I know just from my, my own family research, trying to figure out my side of the family with certain older people dying, you, you lose out on interesting stories. Um, but Ali, what were you gonna say? I did just wanna make a, uh, a footnote and, and a, a reference to the tumultuous news of last week where um, many people and particularly Native Americans, uh, indigenous folks in this country um, made many memes about the CNN gaffe and the classification in the electorate of, of something <laughs> else. We had people had a really good time with that, and we and so we should have because it was, it's 
it, I, I'm, I'm still a little stuck on this question of uh, Na Native American identity. And um, I wanna just restate that even if people look brown, um, that's a point of sensitivity for the Shinnecock because no matter how you look, we uh, all are native and everybody, whether they have dark skin because of their lineage includes former slaves or slaves at the time, um, or whether they look like you knew, you know, uh, native people don't differentiate in the same um, caste system with each other, at least not, not here, not at home with us. Um, and that's why we do have such a, uh, a, a beautiful range of, of skin tones, right? But this idea that native people are still disenfranchised, we're still something else, despite how we may look. One second. Um, oh my God. And. <laughs> Okay, uh, my son told me I was rude. <laughs> well, at least, the, at least the manners are getting. <laughs> Mom's work is never. In any event, so this idea of something else, you know, that Native folks, it's really important that anyone watching who's curious understand that for us, it's really um, vital to be accepted by each other, um, no matter what we look like, um, and we don't, we don't make those, um, those distinctions, at least not not, not uh, in my experience, you know, look at me. I don't, I'm like, I call myself a city Indian. I don't, you know, fit in a lot on the reservation sometimes, but I have all my people that I grew up with and, you know, everybody just accepted that I was, you know, mixed and I look different. So there's all spectrum. And so that's idea of something else is very concerning. And that even though we're still here, um, we are not properly identified as a, um, you know, as, as a, a vital part of the of, of, of the population. Uh, pardon? As a legitimate, you yeah. know, part of the population. Like we vote, we, you know, most people don't understand sovereignty. That's a whole other issue. And the idea of being a US citizen and also being self from self-governed nations, um, having our own governance. Um, so it's complicated, uh, but I, I think the, the, the takeaway should be that native folks, um, you know, if you're Indian, you're Indian, and it doesn't matter what you look like, and nobody's really delving into your, you know, where where the mixing began per se, as long as you have, you know, enough blood to 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 be with your tribe. Um, yeah. And the other thing I will say that, that I'll say in closing that is ties us all together, I hope, is that, you know, Brian had the foresight um, to start interviewing elders, and then you know when when I was lucky enough to get involved and, and do the furtherance of a lot of the work that has been really important to me as sort of soul work of helping people save their family stories. If you're watching and you haven't done this for your own family, I can't emphasize enough how important it is. You don't need a fancy camera crew or you know, a lot of resources, um, even if you just you have an iPhone or a smartphone. Um, the holidays are coming up. I know we're in a tough time and it's, it's, it's anything but, but normal. Having said that, this is this is the time. Don't wait because we never know how long we have. And not to sound macabre, but the, the people don't gather very often anymore, especially especially in Western culture. And um, if you are able to uh, spend time with your elders and you still have some left, please get their stories. Do it for your kids. If you don't have any kids, you maybe you have nieces, nephews, anything. Um, you don't have to be a parent to, to do this for your family. And, and it's something that um, can be a lot of work, but it doesn't have to be costly and you will never regret the time you spent. Yeah, an important production note would be there are no uh, people that we filmed or interviewed that didn't make the cut. We agreed right from the beginning that if they were willing enough, we don't care what they talk about. They are in the film. And when we reach the numbers, that's when we obviously stop. But we didn't shuffle anything. Mm. We just, in the order that we interviewed them, we put them in the movie and let them talk about what they wanted to. We gave them no pointers, no you know, direction. They knew the day before that they were going to be interviewed. So they obviously thought about what they wanted to talk about. A couple of people froze up, so we helped them a little bit, but that's, about you know what either Ali knew about them 
or what Canoe knew about them or what I knew about them just to get it started. But we were going to let the cameras run until they were exhausted with memories. And that's what we did, you know. And just to go to uh, <clears throat> the importance of and going back to um, the concept of the library, um, since filming, since completion of A Thousand Years of Witness, there are elders who are in the uh, film who have True. passed away. Yeah. And again, just um, even before the film was completed, um, that footage was presented to the families of, um, which one was it? Oh, that was uh, James Phillips. James Phillips um, passed away before the, before the film was completed. And um, having that footage to be able to present to the family um, during that time was such a good thing for them yeah. because it allowed the family to see their grandfather smile for one last time and to give, um, I'm gonna start choking up here, <clears throat> see, their, see their grandfather and, and see him smiling and see him, um, and especially being uh, in the nursing home, uh, not a lot of them have, have seen him since he passed. So it was very good to have that so that they could have their final. And, the, and there was distant family too. Yeah. That, you know, even though they want to go see him and over the last four, five, six years, they didn't have the, the opportunity. But once we shared the, uh, their interview, they sent it to those families. So everyone in, in James's family, you know, far and, and uh, close, were all able to see it, knowing that it was literally just two weeks ago. And he was very coherent and funny and willing to participate. And I think it all showed. And it is a very, you know, makes me choke up too. Um, and then he passed away. And the person that's in that interview with him, Walter Weiss, passed away just last year. So they were childhood friends. And they happened to be in the nursing home together. And they happened to both die in the same year. So it's very, very sad, but you know, they're together again. They're playing in the woods. <laughs> and even if someone doesn't pass on, they also can have, you know, life events. Um, there was a, another character person, um, Dorothy Dennis, who had a, a massive stroke just a, a, a week or two after Brian, thank goodness, interviewed her and where to where she was um, lost for, for time, her ability to speak fully. And um, so it was really great for her grandchildren to be able to, and her family, to be able to, uh, to see that. Yeah, yeah, it's a really great, it's a really great thing to have as far as just personally, I think for all these families, to, to have these examples and then academically as well to record all the histories. It's, it's really just a twofold thing that's really fantastic that A, you guys are doing it and B, like Ali said, employing everyone that's watching now, this Thanksgiving, this holiday season, just, you know, interview your family uh, if, you, if you can. It's a good idea, especially if any, uh, any older people in your family you want to get some stories down or even just a really interesting, crazy story an uncle might have. Um, no matter what it may be, uh, you might want that way down the line to remember. Um, and I mean, I just know for myself, my memory is not always the best. Sometimes you forget things. So it's nice to have it written down or, or recorded. Um, but we have a, a few other couple things that people submitted. Um, earlier when we were talking about textbooks that were uh, good that you could re refer to, somebody said that David uh, Truros, Truros, I'm bad with pronunciation, uh, A Heartbreak of Wounded Knee tells true stories. Um, I'm not certain on that one, but I don't know if anyone else is. And then my, my uh, boss actually here at the museum, Todd Evans, asked, um, what do you all think of Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's book, Indigenous Peoples, History of the US? Um, he said that Zinn's book was mentioned briefly, um, which he said is absolutely a vital read and illuminates uh, things left out of curriculums. So are you familiar with this book or? Not me, no. I, I, uh, I, I, to be honest, I, I, I don't really follow other people's works, um, whether it be fact, if it was anything factual in it, and I researched it, then that's one thing, but I'm not just going to casually pick up books and, yeah. and, and, to be honest with you. There's hundreds of textbooks out there, so it's, e it's easy to miss a handful oh, yeah. that come out every now and then. 
you know, when we have an idea to move forward with stuff, I mean, Gnu and myself working on one of Gnu's movies now, you know, we, we do our research and, and between his style of writing and my style of shooting, we, you know, we sister it together, but we want to make sure that everything we do is factual. Oh, yeah. Certainly as far as the American, uh, Native American uh, conscience is concerned, Gnu can talk about that in a second if you want, but, um, you know, I, I think on behalf of the producers and myself, you know, we would like to offer the 1000 Years of Witness to be permanently on your website, because I think it's very important. And you guys provided us with all those historical photos. So I think it was a really great collaboration. But, um, but uh, you know, if Canoe could just, Canoe could just talk about this new piece that we've started, uh, which is, I'm just going to let him basically take over here because it, it really is wonderful. And I'm glad yeah. that Ali's um, on, on to also listen to this. Um, the, okay, so um, going back to what Brian had to say, Native American people are very critical of each other sometimes um, when it comes to oral histories or getting things right. Um, we, we, you know, because of our past with the United States and Canada and all the other countries in, in the Americas, um, we encourage each other in sort of a judgmental way sometimes, but also lovingly and jokingly to make sure that we get things right. Um, and especially if we are representing somebody else's tribe, um, that's a big thing. Um, we do have things in common, but we all do have our differences as well. And they're very specific and um, trying to break away from um, that stereotype that all Indians might be the same. Tribe to tribe, you know, even our languages, you know, there's um, 500, over 565 different tribes still remaining um, in the US and each of us have our own unique language, our own unique relationship to uh, the area that we live and our own customs based off of that, based off of our relationship with, with the earth. So in order to represent somebody else's tribe, what, you know, for example, I'm not Shinnecock, but we have Ali on board. You know, there's fail safes that we have to do. So this new project is called Iron Shirt. And um, it's, it's literally based off of the notion of seeing, um, knowing the history behind um, the old grass dance style shirts that um, the Lakota warriors of the, of the plains used to possess and were bestowed upon their greatest warriors where um, legend has it that the warriors who wore these shirts would be um, untouchable in battle. Sometimes they would say be bulletproof. You know, we have Geronimo and Crazy Horse as um, Crazy Horse was one of these uh, characters, uh, one of these historical figures that we have, um, that it's said that he was bulletproof. And a lot of that credit was given to the shirt that he wore as part of the uh, Tokala society. Um, you know, even soldiers would say that, you know, I, I fired bullets at him and the bullets bounced right off. So using that idea and bringing it into the future and the present of um, today, is issues that we have today, um, but rooting it in, in an idea that we have of the past, um, I decided to use um, this idea with an actual descendant of Crazy Horse, um, a father and a son, and this little boy um, bringing it into the modern would be a superhero in how we view su superheroes in movies today. You know, it's kind of big. And being able to have that representation um, in a story from an Indian perspective, um, written by a native, uh, told by a native, and then verified by actual descendants of um, someone who carried one of these shirts so that you can bring this history to on a platform, just like Thousand Years of Witness, to to have um, to teach the new generation of, of kids about um, in a cool cool way. I, I, I'm hoping um, about this idea about um, 
the impact of the United States government on Indian people and um, also the things that we did in order to rise to the occasion um, and come to the forefront of being what we call warriors today. And each and every Indian, I should say, is a modern day warrior because we battle through the existence of a colonial society every single day. And um, not only do we have to live in this Western culture, but we also have to stay true to who we are as well. And it's a delicate balance and I kind of really enjoy doing that and, and, and Allie and Brian um, being able to support that, you know, it's a, it's, it's a real pleasure and it's a real honor to do that. So, so a kid finds the shirt. It calls to him. Calls to him. He puts it on, even though he's going through difficulty and, you know, life's issues. When he puts this shirt on, he becomes bulletproof. In, you know, the, the metaphorical sense. So um, that's basically the one line description of the movie. Mm -hmm. And staying true to the stories that are happening right now, the way the Native American fishermen up in Nova Scotia, the Mi'kmaq, you know, they're being persecuted by all the other lobstermen. And, you know, government officials in DEC, they're trying to stop them from fishing on their own territory. Same thing is happening here, right here in the Shinnecock. You know, there's, there's restrictions being passed out to the Shinnecock between what they can, when they can, when they can't. And, uh, you know, so again, we've kept something that is actually happening with something that they, that the Native American, you know, in the mythological uh, history is true. And we brought it to today for this piece. So it's, again, it's not a sci-fi. It's, uh, you know, when narrating or, you know, Gnu, because he's writing it, he's narrating it through today's issues, but we're using historical facts. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of all these, all the superhero movies that have been coming out pretty much since I was a kid. And, and I'm trying, I've been racking my brain, guys were talking about it, think, and I can only think of one or two Native American characters that were ever in any of these movies from all the X-Men and the Marvel movies. And, mm -hmm. and they're just side characters. There's no actual plot behind them or anything. So if there could be something like this, that becomes almost like the Black Panther movie, but, but for Native American people that can give you just a, just a representation of, a, of a, a real Native character with tangible, real bits of stories in there too, is, it sounds fantastic. And I think we'd all be excited to see uh, that whenever it comes out. Um, <laughs> we're so excited yeah. because we're doing the trailer that it's so exciting to watch it that it's, it's difficult to agree on everything because yeah. we're so excited. He's excited in his way, I'm excited in my way. So we're trying to involve as few people as we can with the decision-making mm -hmm. so we can keep it big brother, little brother. Um, yeah. And you know, because if we start doing it, trifecta and other people. So we're keeping it a two-man team for now, um, other than some production help and the actors, obviously. But I, I did want to do a shout out, uh, going back to 1,000 Years of Witness, um, one of the mothers from Southampton High School reached out and said, could my daughter um, help you guys out? So we have actually had a second unit camera and she did about 80% of the audios and that's Quintessa Carrick from, uh, from Southampton High School. Pearson, I believe, is it? And her sister provided um, one of the main music tracks for Looking Glass, the, uh, the, the short film that um, Brian and I did before Thousand Years of Witness. So keeping it local. Keeping gotcha. That's all. That's all fantastic. Um, and I have one last question here that's been submitted since we've been talking. Um, and they were asking if Ali can speak about saving personal items to preserve history, like recipes, photos, diplomas. Oh, that's a good question. That's a good one. Uh, that's a wonderful question, and I could talk for hours about that. I don't want to monopolize this um, since it's not exactly it's relevant but it's not relevant to this particular story and um uh but i'm happy to answer questions about that the, the short answer is um it is the question how do you do that or is it important i'm not clear yeah they were they were more so asking you to speak about it in general but um 
but yeah, I think we all agree that preserving items like that, any sort of ephemera is extremely important. That's what most of our collection here at the Southampton History Museum is filled with, is just ephemera. Um, but I guess specifically, how would you say that people in the Shinnecock uh, nation should go about preserving that, that information? Maybe well, we'll I, I don't think we have to make it Shinnecock or non-Shinnecock. I feel like that's sort of the problem going on in our country right now in, in a broader sense, not even metaphorically. I think, you know, the, the same things that are important to Shinnecock people should be important to all people, right? Leave something, you know, better than you found it. Um, respect your elders, save your, your family um, heirlooms and that ephemera so that you have uh, and, and make sure to explain to your children while you're still living or a younger person in your family why it's important because, you know, some things are just stuff, right? We all have too much stuff. But if you're saving a particular item that is significant to your family uh, for any way, for any reason, rather, um, whether it's um, a, a timepiece, you know, from a mother or father or a piece of furniture or um, in, in the case of Native folks, it might be a regalia handed down, which is, a, you know, the gen general name for our traditional dress across tribes. Um, you know, we just passed Halloween. Hopefully everyone has the message that regalia is not a costume. Um, I did see some creative takes on that in these companies that were making costumes and trying to do workarounds. So I had to give them some props. There was one, it was like, it was one of these high-end costume companies that got the catalog and on them. Uh, it was like spirit warrior or something. And it was <laughs> so racist. And yet it wasn't really an Indian, but it was so obvious it was an Indian, you know, because they can't make like Indian costumes anymore and Pocahontas. But in any event, I would say, you know, I think that stuff should be written into your estate more broadly. Um, I often consult with estate attorneys and, um, you know, photographs and things that are irreplaceable should be considered in your estate, in my opinion, as, you know, as, as much as material objects, uh, you know, immigration documents, papers of note, things like that. Um, and in fact, you can make wonderful family history projects um, off of those types of objects. I did a project for a family who were Italian immigrants uh, once using the recipes of the old country, um, which the mother of the family, the elder had maintained coming from as a first, you know, as a being born in Italy and her first generation children had learned all about, um, you know, her old country from her cooking. Um, and so the recipes were woven through family stories, for example. That's fantastic. Yeah, I would, I would definitely implore everybody that's listening now to, to save all that information from your personal families that you can get a nice box and some nice archival uh, sleeves to slip stuff in and if you are not able to hold on to said materials for any reason, there's always different institutions you can look to. Uh, the Shinnecock Museum is potentially one, us here at the Southampton History Museum, even the library. Um, places like that can always uh, help take care of these different pieces of ephemera if families can't. But, and if families do just wanna do it yourself and you're not sure the best ways, I'd be more than happy here to give, tell you all the proper little archival tips and tricks as far as how to store stuff nicely uh that you can keep things at home uh it's definitely but don't like but don't brian can tell you the master photographer do not keep original photographs sitting in frames please scan them yes pay somebody or get a nephew or if you don't have to do it you could do it on a decent scanner please scan all of your ephemera that's photographs. Um, yeah. Do not leave yeah. it in attics and basements because if you have a fire or vermin or flood, that's it. Poof. Yeah. These were great. In yeah. fact, all the photographs that were from the Southampton town, all of them from the Historical Society, I photographed them with my iPhone and put them into the documentary. So, you know, this is great and you can email it to yourself either way you've got the photo. Um, I just wanted to say something that it would be really cool that if, if people realize that there is no stigma attached to the smoke shops um, right there on the reservation because they, they, they don't just sell cigarettes. They, they have gifts, they have artisans, they have handmade stuff. It really is like a mall. They're inviting you into the into the reservation. So anybody can go there 
I'm, you know, just wear the mask and just do the social distancing. But it's not just smoke shops. You can now get oysters that are literally hours old out of the water. You can get mussels, you can get clams. You, there's so many things that you can get there, especially with the holidays coming up. And even with the Christmas day, just not every smoke shop, but a lot of the smoke shops do carry a lot of uh, products. So some of them are kind of closed in, but um, you know, it's, it's not for them. They put them there for us to, to use. So, you know, drop the stigma. And, and go pay a visit. You'll be supporting the tribe. And, you know, they, they put those monies towards the, you know, the childcare and whatever they, whatever they, and even healthcare, I believe, on the reservation too. So, uh, you know, feel free to pay them a visit. It's not a stigmatic property. It's like a mall, but they've given you the opportunity to come into their life a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you'll see that. I know a few of them definitely have uh, handmade uh, art, you know, there's paintings and authentic is the word. Authentic, too. there's the word I'm looking for. Yes, yes, and uh, you know there's other things coming too, but that's a whole different documentary. Yeah. Um, so we're we're at about an hour now, so I don't want to keep everybody that much longer. But if uh, if, if all of you have little last bits of things you want to say or share, uh, maybe Ali will start with you. Uh, if there's any last bits you want to touch on. Uh, no, I, I think I covered it all, you know, the call to action to do this for your own family um, and, uh, and the, the uh, you know, that I, as a Native person, appreciate people's interest, um, as, as long as it's not morbid curiosity, nobody likes that to be <laughs> focused on that. Um, however, you know, the, 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 the stories really do speak for themselves um, in a, I think, a very elegant way. And um, and I, you know, I look forward to doing more of them um, in service to the people of those communities. Great, uh, Ganu, do you have anything? Me. <laughs> I don't know, you know, we ended off with the best voice here, it's Cousin Allie. So. Sounds good. We'll all be on the lookout for Iron Shirt. Um, hopefully everybody here will, will spread around the film. Uh, everybody that already watched, you should have a link. If you have not watched it yet and you're just watching this, um, if you look in the uh, RCP for this talk, you'll see it included in there in that email is a link to watch the film and the password. If you have any issues, contact me here at the museum. I'll pass you all the info so make sure you can see it well. Um, and yeah, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. We had a nice, one of the biggest crowds virtually we've had in a while. So, uh, so thank you, everybody. Great. Awesome. Have a good day. Thank you all. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Bye, Ali. Bye.